The title of my message is, Touching Heaven Brings Abundant Life. Do you believe that you can touch heaven with your prayers? Or are there, are there times when you're having a hard time getting through to heaven? Why do you think that may be? Why would you struggle to pray and touch heaven? If you're a child of God, then you're called by God. You should be able to touch heaven anytime you want, no matter what situation you're in. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 16, if ye, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever ye ask of my Father in my name, he will give it to you. He'll give it you. Whatever we ask, if you're a child of God, and you're obedient, God wants to bless you. You're one of his children. He chose you. You're so special, he chose you. You are his child, and he wants you to touch heaven daily so he can bless you beyond measure. The Lord didn't bring you into the kingdom to be a pauper. He brought you forth so that you could be fruitful and multiply the kingdom abundantly. If there is a need in your life, all you need to do is reach up in faith and touch heaven with your quest and it shall be given to you. I just read that scripture. I think it's amazing that when there's a little baby and it's not even able to talk yet, but it will reach up and the mother will know what the need may be, either to feed him or her or, or pick her or him up. Why is that? She just knows the need of her child. Well, God knows the need of each one of us. We're his children. We have a loving father in heaven, and he wants to feed you spiritually. But when is the last time you reached out to him? Seeking him. In the fifth chapter of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said in verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The Lord wants to bless all of us. But do you put a limit on your blessings? Because you won't reach up for the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, it says, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame to be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. The Lord wants his children to be healthy physically and spiritually. But if you've been disobedient in any way, it's time to make your path straight and touch heaven at any time, day or night. 
God wants to answer your prayers. And he knows what's best for you spiritually, though. But disobedience will disrupt the communication line. So what do you ask for when you pray? How do you pray? Think in your mind, what do you usually ask for? Well, sometimes people ask for something that may not be the best thing for them spiritually. Maybe it's something that will hinder them down the road that God knows about. And they won't be in church all of a sudden. And it's not God's will for them not to be in church. God wants to bless you, but he wants you to be, do your part and be in church. For example, when God blesses you with a home and all of a sudden you want to paint this room, do that to the house, you know, replace the windows, whatever it may be, and all of a sudden these little projects add up and you want to get them all done on the weekend, so you end up missing church. God blessed you with that home, and then all of a sudden, you're missing church because of it? God wants to bless you with nice things, but he also wants you to make sure that you're in your place. You need to put God first, no matter what. Make sure that you always have a standing prayer with God, that you only want his divine will for your life. You may think you know what's best for your life. Usually everybody does. But the devil can deceive you and make you think that something's good for you when God knows better. Look at the Israelites. They went to Samuel when Samuel was old and they wanted him to appoint them a king over them. Now, their request displeased Samuel. And he prayed to the Lord about it. And this was the response that he got back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. The Israelite people got what they wanted, but it wasn't what God wanted, it was what they wanted. And they suffered in the long run. You may think when you get something that you want that it's God's will. But it might not be. You will only have God's best when you are in his divine will. When you're in God's divine will, you will have a strong relationship with the Lord and you will have confidence knowing that he hears your prayers. When you don't have a strong relationship with the Lord, that's when your prayers are not reaching all the way to heaven. So if you're not touching heaven with your prayers, Examine your life. See if you're walking in God's divine will or his permissible will. Elijah, he knew how to touch heaven with his prayers. And he walked in God's divine will. In fact, James said in James 5, verse 17 and 18, Elias was a man subject 
to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Elijah didn't just pray on a whim. No, he was consecrated and dedicated to the Lord. And when he prayed, he reached heaven. Three and a half years of no rain is a long time. But he was under the leadership of God and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And when it was time for that drought to finish, God moved on Elisha to pray again. And that's when it began to rain. How many times has the Lord moved for you to pray on something and all of a sudden you didn't do it? For whatever reason, it seemed a little far-fetched or impossible. So you didn't take the time out and give God what he wanted. You decided you're going to just do your old thing, brush it off. It's, you know, it's probably not the thought of God. You have to be yielded. You have to know when God gives you a thought, you need to be obedient about it. Trust him. Elijah prayed. In God's divine will, and that prayer affected a multitude of people, including Elijah. So what happens when there's a drought? Well, the obvious answer is diminished crop growth, and eventually it leads to famine and hunger. Also, that lack of moisture in the ground will dry up streams and brooks and all of a sudden animals must migrate to different water sources the plants animals and humans cannot survive without water so this was going to be an awful time can you think of all the people who struggled and died during that time. But that was the prayer of Elijah. It was also going to be a challenging time for Elijah. Elijah was going to have to hide out at a brook And in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 2 through 6, And the word of the Lord came unto him, meaning Elijah, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that, shalt, that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. And he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. It's important to take a note here that when God calls you to do something, He's not going to leave you hanging. He's going to take care of you. And that's what he did with Elijah. It's not always going to be an easy path that we have to take. Elijah was going to struggle. It wasn't going to be easy on him either. But remember, 
God promised that he will never leave you or forsake you. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. God was Elijah's helper. And God is our helper. God commanded those ravens to bring bread and flesh in the morning and in the evening. Elijah didn't have to go out and try to hunt or find berries for his food. No, it was brought directly to him by obedient ravens. But eventually, because of the drought, that brook dried up. And, there, and then all of a sudden, do you think Elijah was in trouble now? That he had nowhere to go? That God stopped providing for him all of a sudden? No. God had another plan. Sometimes we might not understand why God works in a certain way. Sometimes situations in our lives may seem to have turned for the worse instead of for the better when you're obedient with God. When in fact, God was creating a situation that will help bless others. Now, God could have provided water for Elijah. You have to realize, God provided water for the Israelites through a rock. God could have done the same thing. God has a plan that will bring you into another situation that you can bless others. There's nothing too hard for God if you're walking in his footsteps. But that wasn't part of God's plan to bring water out of a rock to, for Elijah. God was going to use the faith and confidence of a poor widow woman to make a great and mighty miracle that would be example for people for the ages to come. After the brook dried up, God told Elijah to go to Zarephath because he commanded the widow woman to take care of him. Now, think of the journey on the way to Zarephath. I'm sure Elijah probably saw people on the, by, laying by the side of the road. Maybe some of them weren't even alive. That's what this drought was doing. So when he gets to the city gates, the first thing Elijah sees is the widow woman. And he tells her to go fetch him some water. Now keep in mind, this is a drought. Water scarce. But she doesn't hesitate. She goes right away. And while she's going, she call, he calls on her to bring him a morsel of bread. Now this is where she hesitates. Because she knows She's at the end of her reserves. She only has a little bit of meal left. And her intentions were to just make one last 
cake for her and her son and die. But the man of God is asking for part of that cake. This is where faith steps in. When you flinch, when you hesitate, use your faith. Let your faith step in. Because after she says that there's only enough food for me and my boy. And her, you know, and Elijah says to her in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 13 and 14, and Elijah said unto her, Fear ye not, go, and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord, God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. The widow woman had a choice to make. Was she going to obey Elijah? And believe in the word from the man of God? Or was she going to doubt it? Fortunately, she used her faith and believed that God could do this. That gave God liberty to bless her and her son with plenty of meal and plenty of oil to sustain them throughout that time. When you are willing to be that yielded vessel, you can ask God for something. And God will deliver. Imagine how she felt every day when she was ready to dip into that oil or dip into that, cru that uh, barrel. Those were miracles happening each and every day. Whatever amount she took out, it seemed to just be replaced. There was no decrease. She witnessed a miracle each time. God wants to do that for you. He wants you to reach into his miracle barrel of supply and take whatever you need. It's not going to run dry. It's imp that's an important lesson that we should all learn. Touching heaven requires God's will in your life. Even though the widow woman saw God's miracle of provision every day, she still had a moment of doubt when her son fell ill and tragically died. Now what? Instead of going to the man of God and asking him to pray for her son, she accuses Elijah of being, of causing her son's death. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 18, and she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee? Thou, O thou man of God, Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? Elijah didn't rebuke the woman. 
No. He didn't get on her. He just said, bring him to me. And when she did, he carried him up into his loft, laid him on the bed, and this is where he stretched over, stretched himself over the child three times, and he cried out unto the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. Elijah prayed a simple prayer of about 15 words and touched heaven because it was a prayer of faith. Whatever you're asking for, you must believe. This boy was raised from the dead. The Bible says that the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came again and he was revived. A prayer that touches heaven doesn't have to be a long prayer. It just needs to be a prayer full of faith. That's why when a person who cries out to God in repentance, it can just be a simple prayer. Just in the name of Jesus, Lord, forgive me. Just simple. It just has to be sincere if you want to touch heaven with your faith. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 and 14, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Or how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Or how shall they hear without a preacher? This is why it's very, very important to share the gospel with others. How can lost souls call on the name of Jesus if they've never even heard the word Jesus? You may not have been called to be a preacher, but when you're called into the family of God, you're called to be a witness and tell others about Jesus and what Jesus has done for you. Your love duty is to share the name of Jesus so others can become believers. You know, when we heard about that Maasai tribe in Tanzania, in the very beginning of our Growing in Grace programs, and how they said they've never heard the word Jesus, or they thought it was, you know, Jesus could be a place or a mountain or a tree. Did your heart sink? Like, how can this be? I mean, I've been on the mission field and I've had people tell me they didn't know Jesus. How sad is that? Sometimes we take for granted the fact that we have been blessed with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. To know about him. Many of us have multi multiple Bibles in our home. And we're raised to know Jesus, who he is. But that's even changing in our country, believe it or not. My wife told me an experience that she had up in the Sunday school department where in the Sunday school, a lot of times we get 
new children coming in. And this young boy, not that old, but old enough, you know, maybe seven, eight, or nine, they get a gift basket or a little gift bag or whatever, and it, you know, I have maybe some candies, a little Bible in it, and a couple other things. First time coming in, it's a great little gift to give someone who's first time visitor. So there's a bookmark in there. Most of you know the picture of Jesus holding a lamb. And on that bookmark was Jesus holding that lamb. And she goes, who is that? He didn't know who it was. We're blessed to know the truth. Because there's a lot of people who don't even tell their children about the truth. We can't take anything for granted. That people know about Jesus even in our country. We are blessed to have a Sunday school department with Sunday school teachers that are consecrated and dedicated, willing to teach the children upstairs the full gospel so they can learn about Jesus. We all need to do our part. You know, the children come Friday, Sunday school, then we have Sunday where they can come. But the rest of the week, they may not live in a godly home. It's important to pray with your children before they go off each day so that God can protect them, God can watch out for them, and they get in the habit of praying. The children aren't always going to learn about the truth. That's why it's so important for our children in our Sunday school who come on a regular basis to invite other children to help them be little witnesses. You know, the teachers can teach the children how to touch heaven also. When fiery trials come your way, don't lose hope. Instead, let those trials make you stronger in the Lord. Use your faith. Be a shining light. Because people are watching you. The widow woman witnessed a great miracle when God provided for that drought. But she lost hope when her son died. You need to remember what God has done for you in the past. So that will encourage you when you're forced to go into a deeper valley because of a situation. If you don't have confidence in your prayers to touch heaven, then maybe you're not praying the right way. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, and this is the confidence that we have in him 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear, hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we desired of him. So, are you praying according to God's will for your life? That is very important. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed not for his will. No, he prayed for the Father's will to be done. Jesus knew ahead of time what he was going to be going through. He knew that he was going to be beaten severely, that he was going to be spit upon, mocked, that he was going to be humiliated in, multitude, in front of multitudes of people. But you know what else? He thought all that's going to happen in front of all of heaven. All of heaven saw this happening to Jesus. Believe me, they were watching. Do you know who else was watching? All the demons. All those demons were watching. They had a lot riding on it also. Jesus made the sacrifice. Yes. He was in a human body. But he was the only one that could make that sacrifice. The only one. It was all on him. It was God's plan. It was God's will. Don't think that just because you're in God's will, everything is going to be easy. And there will be people watching. How do you handle yourself? In this trial that you're going through, this situation, are you going to stay in God's will? Or is self going to rise up because it's just a little too tough for you? God loved the world that he gave us Jesus. He loved us so much that he was willing to let his son die. Go through all that he went through so that we could have the opportunity to see him one day. Friend, I'd like to give you an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ into your heart. Pray with me and say, Oh God, save my soul. Forgive me for my sins. But I have come home to serve you the rest of my life. And I believe that the blood of Jesus washes away all of my sins. Come into my heart, Jesus. Come on in, Jesus. Amen. Friend, if you meant that prayer, you have Jesus Christ in your heart. Live for him daily. Get into your Bible. Read the word. Serve him with your whole heart. And always pray for God's will, not your will. And if you have that standing prayer, God will take care of you. And now at this time, those of you that maybe put a prayer request in, we'd like to pray over all those requests. You know, 
Maybe you have sickness in your body. Maybe there's some type of financial need you may have. Well, go ahead and lift up your hand. Put it on the screen. If you can't make it to the screen, just lift up your hands where you're sitting. And I'm going to raise my hand, and this is a point of contact. The Bible says that believers will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I'm a believer. Reverend Chris Mockamer is a believer. And there's many believers in this sanctuary that are going to pull down heaven for you to receive whatever your need may be. Lord, Heavenly Father, just move for them, them in a great and mighty way. Break all bondage, set them free in the blood name of Jesus. Heal in the holy blood name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Heal in the holy blood name of Jesus. And Lord, do anoint them for whatever their need may be. Bless them and keep them and let them walk in your will. Amen. God bless you. And now, at this time, those of you, if you need prayer, you can go to my left and your right. And the rest of you, I'd like to encourage you to come down front to receive more power from on high. Now, maybe you just received Jesus Christ in your heart. That means your blood washed. But now it's time to get spirit filled. Meaning that by receiving the Holy Spirit into your vessel of clay. And when you do that, when you're that you the best, so the Holy Spirit can come on in, take over your tongue, and speak in a heavenly language. It won't be you doing it. It'll be the Holy Spirit doing it. All he just wants is a clean, yielded vessel. Friend, I'm going to call down a great anointing for you to receive the Holy Ghost. Those of you that already have the Holy Ghost, just yield on over to more power from on high. Lord, Heavenly Father, I call down this great anointing upon the people. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And just start praising them, friend. Glorifying Jesus. Glorifying the King. Praising Jesus. Yes, just fall in love with those praises. Just you and Jesus. Just you and Jesus. Just yielding on over. Let that power go all through your body. Yes, let him bless you. Let them bless you, just you in Jesus, just you in Jesus, glorifying the King. Praise the Lord, oh, praising Jesus, glorifying Jesus. Lord, oh, bless each one today. Anoint each one, dear Jesus. Glory, glory, glory to Jesus, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise you, Jesus. We honor you, dear Jesus. Glory, glory to Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glorifying the Lord. Oh, praise you, Jesus.